So good morning to everyone. Um, we have exactly nine o'clock, so we should start today's lecture. Uh, let me introduce our expert, Carlos Romao. So Carlos, could you please switch on the screen, the camera? Now, yeah, it, it, it works. So before I will introduce you, uh, let me uh, share with you a few uh, information about the organization of the lecture. So, at first of all, of course, uh, let me welcome you all, all on the lecture, uh, or the webinar that is within the project uh, Nature Conservation Trends uh, that is implemented under the Norwegian funds, the call Rhine, raising public awareness in the field of improving the environment in ecosystems in the Czech Republic. And that's implemented, the project is implemented thanks to the support of the State Environmental Fund of the Czech Republic. Before we will start the presentation, allow me some information about the uh, organization and also your active participation at this lecture. So at first, the presentation will last approximately 40 minutes, and then we will have a discussion uh, with the lecture with, with Carlos Romao. The event is being recorded, as you might notice already, uh, because it will be later posted on the project channel on the YouTube platform. Uh, so everyone who is not able to join us today can uh, uh, can watch it later uh, and utilize the information that we will be given by the lecturer. Uh, you can ask questions during the lecture, during the presentation, using a chat. Uh, so this is the icon uh, in the bottom bar. Uh, those questions will be read uh, by my colleagues, Michal Kashner and Andrea Shandova, and, the, uh, and those will be asked later after the presentation. Uh, you can also ask questions to the lecturer after the presentation uh, later, uh, or, and in that sense, please use uh, or raise, uh, but I can, I can, I can um, uh, repeat it after the presentation. Uh, you can ask your questions uh, by raising your hand after the presentation uh, in the reaction icon that is also in the bottom bar. Uh, you can find it there. So that's all for the beginning. Uh, I hope that we will have a fruitful more or less one hour together. And now let me um, introduce our experts, our expert that, uh, that join us today. This is Carlos Romao uh, from the European Environment Agency. As you might read in the invitation, Carlos uh, is the nature and biodiversity expert, worked at the Portuguese Nature Conservation Agency, then later uh, for the European Commission. He was also manager of the European Topic Center on Biodiversity, and currently he works at the environmental, the European Environmental Agency, uh, uh, where he is responsible for data information and assessments on nature and biodiversity. So he will give us an overview of data sources available to assess status and trends uh, of biodiversity and nature at the European scale, which I hope is quite um, interesting, but also could be useful not only at the European scale, but also in the Czech Republic when trying to improve our nature conservation tools. So, Carlos, uh, floor is yours. Thank you, and dobre uh, itro. Okay, well, thank you, first of all. Thank you very much for the invitation uh, for this uh, talk, and I hope uh, it can bring some uh, clarification and some ideas of uh, what we do at the European Environment Agency and what concerns data on nature and biodiversity. So I'll uh, just give you uh, the, the topics I will go through this uh, next minute. So first I will just tell a few words about the agency, uh, an overview of the data that we collect and where does this data comes from also uh, raise some issues about missing data or problems in terms of scale or harmonization of data at the European level. Uh, we also collect other biodiversity data or information. And uh, then I will try to also give an overview of the different uh, tools we have to make this data available. And uh, also, what do we do with this data? 
we collect the data, but then what do we do or what do other um, European organizations do with the data that is collected? And finally, I will uh, focus on the biodiversity strategy for 2030, uh, just with uh, some highlights that are more relevant to our topic uh, on nature. Uh, so the, the European Environment Agency is one agency of the European Union. So it's not the European Commission, it's not the Parliament, it's one, let's say, independent agency, which has its own governing body, but it was, um, let's say, uh, created uh, by the European Union, although it's open to countries that are not from the EU. And uh, basically what we have to do is to collect information in terms of all aspects of environment, uh, nature, but also on air quality, water, uh, issues of climate change, etc., and provide this information or convert this data and this information into uh, something that the policymakers can make, uh, be it at the European level or at the national level. And of course, also another function is to uh, make this information understandable for the interested uh, public. Uh, together with the agency, uh, the, the, the this European Environment Information and Observation Network was created. And this is the partnership of all the countries that are uh, members uh, of the agency. Currently, there are 32 members and six cooperating countries in the West Balkans. And the third pillar of the setup of the agency are the European topic centers, which basically are consortia of organizations that apply for for this function for periods of four or five years, uh, and also the terms of reference of this term, this uh, topic centers can be changed depending on the priorities uh, of work. So this was the overview about the agency and IONET and the topic centers, and I'll go uh, then start with uh, information about the data we collect and what it comes from. Uh, basically, we have, uh, we can say that the data we have comes from three different uh, um, sources, let's say. The first and the major one is all the EU reporting obligations. It means all the information that the countries, the member states of the European Union, are obliged to report to the Commission. In, the, in our case, uh, we'll see we have mainly the, the birds directive, the habitats directive, uh, more recently also the invasive alien species regulation, etc. Uh, the third is about the IONET reporting, which is the data that is reported on a voluntary basis by all the member countries of the agency, so the 38 member countries. And uh, finally, we have an information system on nature, where also different data is collected more or less in an ad hoc basis uh, by ourselves and the topic centers. I'll now focus much more on the, uh, the reporting obligations in terms of, of nature. And um, uh, just from the birds and the habitats directive, uh, we have three main streams of data. Uh, one of them is uh, the reporting on the status and trends of different species and habitats. Uh, and this is the birds reporting on Article 12 and for habitats and other species, the Article 17. And this is done every six years. Um, Another data collection is about derogations from this uh, from these two directives, and I will give more details later on. The third stream of data is about Natura 2000, so all the sites that are 
classified and designated by the member the countries. And the third um, aspect uh, or set of information we collect is about invasive alien species, which is a relatively new regulation from 2014. So if we look at the nature reporting, uh, both the for the birds and the habitats directive, uh, so for birds, this concerns all birds that occur naturally in, in Europe. So about 500 species and subspecies. And for the habitats directive, we have about 1,400 species uh, of animals and plants that are covered by this directive and 233 habitats. I should now say 232 because there is one habitat type that does no longer exist in the European Union because of Brexit. Uh, it was the, the Caledonian forest that only existed in Scotland. So for each one of these habitats and, and species, the countries have to report a series of information in terms of distribution uh, data with uh, maps on a scale uh, of, uh, of 10 by 10, but also on population uh, sizes, areas of habitats, trends. That is also reporting on pressures and threats, uh, conservation measures that are taken for each one of these species and habitats. Also some information about uh, how much of these species and habitats is covered by Natura 2000 and what are the trends in the network. There is also information on hunting, exploitation and collection of species, which is also covered by these two directives. And uh, finally, one very important uh, aspect that is uh, reported by countries is the conservation status of the different species and habitats. But this only applies for the habitats directive. Uh, looking at the conservation status assessments, uh, there are two levels of these assessments that are done. The first one is, as I mentioned before, at the member state level. So each country has to assess on the basis of, uh, of criteria that was uh, agreed uh, between the experts of all the countries and make these assessments on the conservation status and the trends in the conservation status. And this is done for each one of the biogeographical regions existing in each country. Uh, following this uh, data uh, from the member states, we at the European level make an overall assessment of the conservation status at the biogeographical region or in case of the marine species and habitats at the level of the different um, marine regions as defined by the Marine Strategic Framework Directive that defined the different seas and sea regions in the territories of the EU. For the birds directive is slightly different because there is no obligation of the countries to make an assessment of the conservation status. Therefore, the countries only report about uh, population sizes and trends at the member state level. But then uh, there is also an assessment of the status. Uh, we call it population status because the representatives of member states didn't like the word conservation status for birds. So we call it population status, but it's equivalent to conservation status. And normally this is done, or it has been done in the, the two times that this assessment was done for Europe by contractors of the European Commission. And this has been uh, done by BirdLife International and IUCN. Just a few words uh, on these different parameters to assess the conservation status. I will not go into the detail, but I think when we then we look at uh, the gaps uh, that still exist and the problems in reporting, I think these uh, different parameters and the way they are assessed are very important. Uh, so for species, uh, 
One parameter is about the range, which is basically the envelope around the distribution of each species or habitat, the population sizes, the habitat of the species and the future prospects, which is a kind of a, a expert assessment in terms of the balance between the pressures ongoing and the perspectives of the conservation measures to deal with these pressures. There are some rules about uh, when to consider the status favorable or unfavorable, but I will spare you the details uh, here. But if you're interested, we can discuss it later on. For birds, as I said, uh, there is no assessment of status by the countries, but there is this assessment of short and long term trends for both breeding populations and wintering populations were relevant. So this, um, this, um, this uh, EU level assessment, I mentioned it before, so it's made for the biogeographical region of uh, of the European Union and um, this basically this table summarizes what I've described in the previous slide. Uh, we have uh, you see here in the middle middle this good poor bad it's a uh, easy words we found to uh, to uh, shorten the very long uh, uh, names that are officially given to favorable and favorable inadequate or unfavorable bad when you were doing graphics or communicating this to the public it seemed rather confusing so lately we have been using these three words to describe uh, these terms and they are equivalent between uh, the assessments that are done for the habitats and species of the habitats directive and the population status of birds this is just a, a very uh, i'm not going to go into the detail but this is a very uh, it's pulling together all the assessments at uh, at EU level and the different colors give you on the top give you the conservation status uh, and on the bottom is about the the trends uh, on populations for birds and on conservation status for species I will give you later on some links where you can dig some of this information from the member state level by geographical region to the EU level uh, and within different groups of species and habitats. But we, the presentation is already too long for introducing more detail about this. So the other part of, uh, of uh, or data that we collect is on these derogations, which is basically uh, an exception to the strict protection regime that is given by the birds and the habitats directive. And where the countries uh, have to report under which legal justification they have gave uh, uh, a certain authorization, uh, be it uh, to kill some animals or to collect some plants uh, or to disturb uh, breeding places whatever is but all these uh, actions and justifications are specified in the articles of both the birds and the habitats directive they also also have to indicate which species the the these derogations were given and the number of individuals that were concerned uh, this is just a snapshot of a, a dashboard uh, where we can uh, look for the the derogations given by the different countries where you can choose the period um, if it is about the birds or the habitats directive which country or species etc so I will also not give some detail. And one thing about the derogations is this is also an obligation of the Bern Convention. Uh, but since uh, many years now, the countries don't have to make a report to the EU and a report to the Bern Convention. The countries only report once to the European Commission. And then these reports are systematically made available to the Bern Convention, which reduces the administrative burden of the countries to report to do different entities the same thing 
the invasive alien species regulation uh, also uh, has some uh, reporting obligations currently uh, this uh, regulation concerns uh, 66 species this list of uh, invasive alien species of union concern is uh, updated regularly so uh, currently uh, it has 66 species but this changes over time um, and of course in terms of the reporting the countries have to indicate uh, the different prevention measures what was done in terms of early detecting and eradicating uh, newly arrived invasive alien species and how are they managing the species that are already widespread in the country um, the last report were, it's also a six-year report uh, that was uh, covering the period 2015 to 18. Uh, it's not six years because this was the first report and the regulation is only from 2014 but from now on it's on six-year periods and we also have uh, this is just an overview in terms of uh, the number of species in each country and the different measures that were uh, taken and depending on the category of the measures and we also have some uh, dashboards that allow you to go and look uh, for the detailed information be it by invasive alien species or by country or by type of uh, action that was taken so i'll go now leave the let's say the reporting on species uh, and look a bit to the reporting on sites and this concerns mainly the natura 2000 network uh, as you many of you may know we collect this information from the countries uh, on databases with the descriptive data that is uh, uh, according to a format and a content that was adopted uh, by the commission consulting the countries and working with the different experts to identify the data to be reported but also uh, spatial data about the boundaries of each one of these uh, Natura 2000 site um, just a, a, an overview so basically we have now uh, about 18.5 percent of the EU land that is covered by uh, Natura 2000 sites and this is about uh, 9 percent of the the EU seas um, and the graph also indicates the part that is only for birds in red in blue only for the habitats directive and the oh you know that there are a lot of overlaps between special protection areas for birds and sites of community importance under the habitats directive so the orange bar gives the uh, overall network at the european level and we also have um, uh, a viewer uh, here i focused a little bit on the, the on czechia and uh, where you can look for and make specific search on names of sites or a particular species or a habitat type and uh, you can obtain this information online it's a i think it's a rg's uh, online application so this was a very quick overview of the data we collect from the reporting obligations and I also told you that the, from the AONET, the network of the 38 countries, uh, we only have, only have one data set that is collected, which is this uh, designated uh, sites at uh, the national level. So nationally protected areas that are not Natura 2000 because that is collected under a specific uh, data flow. And these are uh, protected areas uh, at the national level under different categories. This already started a long time ago, this data collection. Uh, there was a kind of a uh, exploratory environmental program in, in 95 that was called the Corine program. And there was one component that was called the Corine biotopes, 
where this uh, information on sites uh, was started to be collected. So currently, what are we collecting? Uh, also the boundaries of these sites, the designation types, what are they? Are they a nature reserve, a national park, uh, forest reserve, etc. according and the designation types are those that exist in member states or in the country's legislation. Unfortunately, we are not collecting yet any ecological information about these sites. For Natura 2000, we know for which species and which habitats, and we have data on uh, how much exists in the site uh, and other ecological information. But for these uh, um, national protected areas, we have no ecological information. And uh, also uh, the collection of this data uh, is uh, given to uh, the World Database on Protected Areas. Uh, and therefore, so the countries don't have to also send this data to the to the to the, the this database. We do it on behalf uh, of the countries. And this is just pulling out information from Natura 2000 and from uh, the CDDA database. I just took some figures for 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 Czechia in terms of the number of sites. Uh, and we can see that, for instance, about 35% of the sites that are reported by Czechia are only re reported through national law, so they are not Natura 2000. Uh, we have about 21% that is only Natura 2000 status and no, let's say, uh, not a protected area in, in, uh, in, in the common sense. And there is a a relatively big overlap between areas that are both Natura 2000 and a national park or a nature reserve. Uh, also interesting from the data reported, we can see a, a little bit the, 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 the size of the areas. And we see that for, for Czechia, for instance, 84% of the sites are less than one uh, square kilometer in size, which are relatively small sites. So um, I've looked at the EU reporting obligations to the data we get through IONET. And this is the third, uh, let's say, collection of data we do uh, on this European Nature Information System that we call UNIS, where we have different modules, uh, species. We are mostly collecting data on species that are covered by legislation. Uh, it collects and brings together the sites from Natura 2000 and the CDDA. Uh, and uh, we are also developing uh, or maintaining a habitat uh, classification system, uh, for uh, which is pan-European, which covers all Europe, um, and which is currently uh, uh, or regularly revised when there is new information and so on. Uh, we also incorporate in this uh, uh, in UNIS uh, the data that is collected under the European Red List made by uh, IUCN. And uh, you may know that in the past, the European Commission has been financing uh, the production of European, let's say, EU Red Lists and European uh, Red Lists. And this information is also uh, brought together in this UNIS system. And this is just the, the home page of UNIS where we uh, can make searches uh, for both species or habitat sites. But there are also some uh, already made queries that can bring you together the information of these three different modules. So now I wanted just to say a few words about um, data gaps and issues that we have with the data. So when we see uh, this overview, we can see that this is a lot of data. And I don't think there is any um, regional organization in the world that collects so much data. 
But this does not mean that we don't have problems with the data that is collected. And uh, from the data reported, uh, we can see that uh, one of the ma main shortcomings in terms of this data is that the inventories and the monitoring of species and habitats is in some cases absent. Uh, or it can be incomplete or not adequate. We see also a large variability between the countries, between different species and habitats in terms of monitoring, for instance. I know that in Czechia you have a, a relatively good monitoring systems uh, and normally the data is uh, relatively good, but uh, we cannot say the same for all countries. and. Um, Another aspect, and uh, of course, uh, the worse the data is, the more problems we have in terms of comparing it or giving European overviews to compare countries. And, uh, and of, of course, uh, we, I, I will show some numbers, but we have a lot of uh, data missing in terms of trends which uh, in terms of policy making, that's normally what the policy makers want to know. Is it going better or it's, is it going worse? The situation of the different species and habitats. And quite often there are too much gray area to give a formal answer. Uh, also what we see is that for instance, one the countries report on, on pressures, most of this information is uh, qualitative uh, and there is very little, uh, let's say, uh, information that is derived uh, uh, from really from field observation or monitoring. And often this information is based purely on expert opinion. It doesn't mean that the experts don't have a good opinion, but uh, any opinion is always subjective. Uh, also on protected areas, um, well, I told you that for the CDDA, of course, we are not yet collecting data on ecological information, which is a big uh, handicap. But for Natura 2000, we do. Uh, but one thing we don't, are, we, have, uh, we are not yet collecting in a systematic way is an information that allows us to evaluate the effectiveness of protected areas. There is currently ongoing discussions uh, with the Commission and the countries in order to bring some of this information into the standard data form so that in the future we may have some information to uh, allow us to make some effectiveness assessment of protected areas. <clears throat> this is just an example. Uh, and the graph here groups uh, the origin of the data for, from the article uh, 17 on, on species and habitats and for, for birds. Uh, and you can see that uh, on the left, we have data that is coming from complete surveys. And for the overall, for the habitats and species of the habitats that are active, this is only 21% of the data reported. Um, and we have 36% of the data that is either absent, reported as unknown or not reported at all, or that is purely based on expert opinion. Uh, for birds, um, and this is not a surprise, 37% comes from, from complete surveys, and we have a, lit, a little bit less absent data uh, and coming from expert opinion. But there is a huge variability uh, in terms in the different uh, countries. For instance, uh, for the Article 17, uh, in some countries, or only 4% of the data comes from um, complete surveys, uh, while in others may reach the 76%. I believe that Czechia is more close to the 76%. 76% than the 4%. For birds, we have even the situation where less than 1% is coming from complete surveys. 
but in other countries, this is very close to 100% coming from complete surveys. So just to give you an idea that the variability uh, of the, let's say, the origin and the quality of the data can be very different, uh, not only between different species and habitats, but also between different countries. Um, this is just a, a complement to the previous slide uh, that is indicating the missing or unknown information that even for birds, uh, and this was a little bit a surprise to me to see that, for instance, um, we still have quite a lot of unknown trends for wintering populations, uh, even short term. And of course, for long-term trends, the, the unknown information is relatively large. It was a big surprise because birds are one of the groups that is, uh, which has a, a longest tradition of monitoring in, uh, in, in Europe and uh, with a large network of uh, organizations uh, and individuals making uh, uh, this monitoring. Um, one of the aspects I wanted to highlight here uh, of the main missing and the non-information is about is for the habitat types, uh, where in general the trend in the area of the habitat type is that is a, a large percentage of missing or unknown information, and also the habitat condition, uh, which is one of the aspects that uh, is used to evaluate these structures and functions of the different habitats, which is one of the parameters to evaluate the conservation status. And of course, we are also missing trends within the ne network, the Euro 2000 network. I believe this is also uh, due either to the lack of monitoring or because the monitoring that is in place doesn't allow to distinguish trends outside and inside the Natura 2000. And this is a matter of the design and the density of the sampling that is done. Again, um, this missing and unknown information is also very variable according to the countries uh, that go can go from very little as two or 4% to almost half of the information being missing or being unknown. Um, another aspect that we have, uh, we still have, despite the very long discussions and being a recurrent subject when the countries meet uh, in these biogeographical seminars and discuss about particular habitats in particular regions, is that not everybody has the same definition of a one specific Annex 1 habitat type. There may be variability. Um, one member state may say that uh, this is grassland 6210, and another member state say, oh, in my case, it's 6220. So this is uh, one of the issues. I don't think it's the most fundamental one, but it's still one of the issues. Uh, in terms of harmonization. What I found more uh, relevant is uh, about the monitoring and the assessment of this condition of habitat. Um, the guidance that we were able to put together until now is uh, not so much. And therefore, the different countries are using different variables uh, to evaluate uh, abiotic, biotic characteristics, and so on and so forth, which makes also the comparability between uh, the condition of different of the same habitat type in different countries much more problematic. Uh, I can also tell you that the the, the commission is is uh, is um, about to launch a big contract in order to have. Um, in um, let's say in agreement with the countries uh, that for each habitat or group of habitats we identify at least the key um, uh, characteristics variables and thresholds 
to be used in order to promote a better harmonization of these assessments. So um, I think this was um, uh, what I wanted to tell you about this data that we collect and uh, quality assure and make available uh, around the, the EU obligations, the IONET and, and UNIS. And I will just briefly touch upon some other data we already get in a, let's say, in a aggregated way. One of it is, um, it's, um, and I think maybe many of you are involved in, uh, in, in doing this work, is, uh, is the, the common birds in, in Europe that we, we get from, uh, from, um, from EBCC and that is used in many aspects. And I will give you some uh, examples. Uh, another indicator we collect also from Butterfly Conservation Europe is about uh, grassland butterflies. And that is one huge data set that we also, uh, let's say, we don't collect. The satellites collect it, but we, in the agency, process this data uh one this comp component of this earth observation system in europe that is called copernicus and there is one component of copernicus that is called the land monitoring service and this land monitoring service produces uh, several products i think one of the most known ones is this corin land cover um, but also some other data data uh, sets that may be very uh, useful, some of them at the resolution of uh, 10 meters, uh, not talking about uh, uh, one kilometer or even 100 meters, but some of this parameter of this observation is done at the scale of 10 meters. And I think, I believe some of them even to one meter resolution, which is uh, very, very good for many of the analysis that can and be be made. I will not go into details of this uh, of these different data sets. You have the link down there, and but I, I think it's worthwhile exploring what is already available. And uh, new projects come almost yearly, uh, coming from, from this program. Um, so just briefly, uh, the Corinne Land Cover is a vet vector based data set, and there are. Uh, collections made on different years. The last one is 2018, and I think there is another one in production uh, currently. And this uh, high resolution layers, which are raster based, uh, and also have some information that is very relevant uh, for nature conservation. And um, yeah, um, so there are many products that are coming in the coming or this year and in the coming years. So um, I wanted now to give an overview of how we make this data available. Well, in some of the slides I've presented before, you could already see what was uh, available, uh, how we make this information available, but I'll briefly go through it. So we have both the spatial and descriptive data sets that are available in our data service and can be downloaded. We have thematic web pages, data viewers, web tools, dashboards. If you remember the images from the invasive alien species and the derogations, those were dashboards, which are interactive because you can play with them and filter the information you want. We also have systems uh, that show the indicators, information systems, and of course, publications in, term, in, form, in terms of, uh, of uh, reports or briefings that we make regularly available. And of course, all this information is publicly available. Anybody can download data sets and use them. Uh, of course, we, for instance, for the Birds and the Habitats Directive, any sensitive information about the location of particular species are uh, not in the public databases, but this has to be flagged by the countries uh, when they do the reporting to indicate which uh, 
uh, data is sensitive and should not me, be made publicly available. Um, just a couple of examples. Uh, for instance, for the invasive alien species, we have a warm homepage that gives you access to the different products. And here there is a, a list of the innumerable um, data sets that you can see online. We also have a web page uh, for the nature reporting under the birds and the habitats directive that uh, also gives you access to the different uh, data sets, both at the national level and at the EU level. This is just an example of a tool uh, that can be used to choose the reporting period, uh, which uh, habitat here I filtered one of the grasslands, the sub panonic steppic grasslands that also exists in, in Czechia. And you can see in the tables there is data and the assessments made by the countries and at the EU level. You can also explore this for both the birds and the habitats directly. We have different uh, information systems uh, on biodiversity, but also on freshwater that brings together information from the Water Framework Directive. Uh, we have information system on the marine environment about the good. Uh, environmental status of waters from the Marine Strategic Framework Directive, uh, data on forests, uh, etc. We are currently in the process of um, making these systems uh, a bit more, uh, let's say, uh, coherent between any of them and to allow easy navigation between all different systems and we hope that in the next uh, one or two years we will have um, this uh, improvement in place we also have some of the data sets that combine for instance uh, here just an example of combining the data coming from Corinne land cover with the natura 2000 sites where you can browse and look and see which cover exists in the different sites, but also to analyze uh, the changes in the land cover and the land use within and outside Natura 2000, which also has some relevance. So what do we do with this data? Uh, basically, and this is the mandate of the agency, is to uh, process this data, make analysis and assessments that can be used to evaluate the different policies. Uh, we have uh, many different uh, policies that are of European responsibility, and therefore this information can feed into different processes, and I'll give some more examples. Of course, it's also for legislation, uh, and to make this regular uh, assessments of the state of the environment and the state of nature. A lot of this data is used in research projects, but also in consultancies, both for private use or consultants that are working for the European institutions that can download and use this information. A bit more in detail, what, for instance, the Commission does with some of this data. Uh, there is uh, some indicators, for instance, for the common agricultural policy. And currently, uh, for instance, these uh, indicators on the conservation status of uh, and trends of agricultural uh, species and habitats. The farmland bird index is also used and the Natura 2000 in terms of how much agricultural area in Natura 2000. Uh, the Commission is also using the data reported by the countries to evaluate these CAP national strategic plans, which are the interpretation of the, the European um, policy and how it's transposed, what the countries are proposing to finance. And there are some provisions about the environment and about nature and the information about nature is used also by, for instance, the, the, the director general that deals with environment to look at these plans and to see if there are any major issues concerning nature. It's also used to select life projects 
but also to investigate any legal infringement that uh, may exist uh, and to make impact assessments when the Commission is proposing new legislation. And I will give you an example. Um, and it, it's also used to review the existing legislation. Is it working? Is it not working? What is working? Uh, what needs to be improved, uh, etc. Uh, I will, because I see I'm probably over my time, so I will uh, just briefly give some elements about the biodiversity strategy for 2030. Uh, that is part of this big policy package uh, from this uh, European Commission that is called the Green Deal. And the EU biodiversity strategy is one of the pillars of this uh, Green Deal. Um, basically, there were three aspects uh, in the strategy, protecting and restoring nature, enable transformation, and the global biodiversity agenda also to see what is the impact that the EU has outside the EU in terms of biodiversity and how, how can the EU support uh, biodiversity outside of the EU. Uh, this is just a snapshot of the different elements of the protected and restoring nature. Uh, we have the protected areas, but also on the EU nature restoration plan, there are a lot of different elements that also deal with agriculture, with forests, uh, soils, water, uh, energy, uh, urban areas, pollution, invasive alien species. But I will just focus on these first two, uh, the protected areas and the legal framework for nature conservation. So uh, you may have already have heard about this target of uh, protecting 30% of land and 30% of sea, be it through Natura 2000, national protected areas, and these other effective area-based conservation uh, measures. From this 30%, 10% should be strictly protected. And the, the strategy also says that this should include all remaining primary and old growth forests. And as I mentioned before, uh, we still, don't have much tools to evaluate how effective the, the different protected areas are managed. And we know that many of them are paper parks. They exist in a decree or in a map, in an office, but have no effect on the ground. Uh, so this is a EU target, but each country should contribute to uh, um, make its own contribution to this 30%. It doesn't mean it has to do 30% at the country level. It's the EU level that has to reach this 30%. The Commission has developed some criteria and guidance. And under the name there, there is a link. And until the end of the year, the countries have to submit uh, pledges or uh, the contributions they will make for this target. The other... Uh, two aspects I wanted to mention on the EU nature restoration plan is illegal. Uh, is this proposal the Commission is working on to adopt a regulation on nature restoration? And um, unfortunately, uh, this was planned for December. It was postponed for exactly today. But uh, last week, the Commission. Uh, or the cabinet of the president of the commission decided to suspend the approval of this. Um, there are probably reasons linked to uh, the issues with the war uh, in Ukraine and food security issues. And so aspects that were having possibly impact on agricultural and use of uh, pesticides, this legislation has been suspended for the time being. Let's see what is coming in the, in, in the next days to see if this proposal that is already done uh, will be made public and start the discussions with the parliament and the council. So, and the other aspect of the strategy was to raise the implementation of the legislation that already exists 
And so there is this target of no deterioration of conservation status and also to improve the, the, the status and trends of the different species and habitats. And as for protected areas, the Commission developed guidance on this and the countries also have to make an indication of which species and habitats they will target for this 30%. Um, so as, as I mentioned, there are many other aspects in the, in the nature restoration plan of the biodiversity strategy. I will not give details because I think you are probably already knocked out with so much information in so little time. And I'm sorry for that. Chikuyu. Alosh, thank you very much for the information, for your presentation. And uh, especially, uh, at least in my view, it was quite comprehensive overview of what is available uh, at the European scale and what is mainly coming from the EU member states as the, as the source of the, or the original source of information. So now I would like to ask audience for questions. Uh, let me also apologize that in some parts uh, we missed a few uh, uh, images, not, but not fully, but partially. So for the next time, we will work uh, on the improvement at the technical level. It's mainly about the connection. So uh -huh. um, are there any questions? Yes, Andre, uh, I see you raise your hand. Uh, good morning from Prague. Uh, you mentioned the uh, Green Deal in connection to the uh, strategy. Uh, some voices are being heard that the Green Deal is over with the war in Ukraine. What is your opinion to it? Well, um, I don't think the Green Deal is over. Uh, because there are some opinions that, uh, let's say, uh, with the war, basically on two aspects, the energy aspect and also the food security aspect. Some people are claiming that, uh, well, we don't have time now and it's not uh, the opportunity to deal with these uh, issues of decarbonization and uh, and uh, making our agriculture more sustainable and more uh, nature friendly. These are one, one set of voices, but there are also many other sets of voices that says, no, this is maybe the opportunity really to invest in uh, a more sustainable Europe. And, uh, and uh, let's say the, the agricultural, production is not just about pesticides and, uh, and fertilizers. Uh, and you have to look at, uh, at the full system of the food production uh, and consumption. And we know that, for instance, uh, over 25% of food that is produced is lost from the farmer uh, until our dish. So there is quite a lot of opportunities to improve the systems we have and to modify them and make, it, make them less uh, um, sensitive to, uh, to crises like the awful one we are, we are listening. So I also hear that those voices, but I think there are many different voices. And in my opinion, I don't think the Green Deal is, is, is that. That's my personal opinion, maybe my wishful uh, thinking. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Glad to hear it. And uh, other, other question, and the last one from me. Uh, you showed a lot of data, uh, mainly based on um, official national systems. Uh, I would like to ask if there is any possibility to count also with, uh, let's say, private reserves or uh, those uh, voluntary activities that are uh, not uh, supported, let's say, by, by a state, but, but which function mm -hmm. in the area? Yeah, yeah, I understand. Well, um, the, the thing is, uh, institutionally, uh, the data, for instance, for the EU reporting obligations, the only uh, source we can take is what the countries report officially. But this also depends very much on the countries. I know that many countries, to, in order to be able to report officially, 
they make use of the innumerable data that is collected by individuals and by organizations that are, uh, let's say, private uh, or from different uh, associations. Uh, so that information can also, uh, and, and we know, uh, I don't have the data here, but, uh, but there is a large percentage of the information that is officially reported that is already coming from what we may call the citizen science. So individuals and organizations that are collecting information on a voluntary basis. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So thank you very much for the question as well as answer. Uh, is there any other answer, uh, question? If not, I have one. Uh, and thank you very much, Carlos, for mentioning this restoration law because a lot of people really waited for this day to um, for the release of this restoration law uh, text because this is it looks like the, the the most important legislative piece in the nature conservation for next ten years at least. So it's pitted that it's um, hopefully just delayed uh, the process. Um, but my question is because we have already approved biodiversity strategy EU biodiversity strategy 2030, and this is the first time in which. Um, which we have uh, protected areas, nationally designated areas as a tool that is also used by the European Commission, in fact, um, as a nature conservation tool to improve the status of biodiversity. You also mentioned that we have, you and also we as states mainly, uh, we don't have any quality data about management effectiveness and also the status and trends in protected areas. Is there any idea how to improve it uh, or is it connected to this restoration law? Well, uh, it's true that uh, that is uh, rather a, a good news that for this uh, target of the 30% and the 10% strictly protected areas, um, we are including all types of areas uh, that may have uh, a nature conservation objective or at least a nature conservation, um, uh, let's say, outcome in the way they, they are managed. That's, that's a very good thing. Um, as I've mentioned, currently for Nature 2000, um, there is a discussion within the, the Commission and the countries to bring some additional information that could help in assessing the effectiveness of protected areas. Um, I don't think the purpose is to, um, to look at each individual protected areas and see if it is effective, but to look at the network of protected areas and see if it is effective in terms of delivering, uh, improving the condition of, the, of particular species or restoring particular habitat types and, and so on. Uh, also in this process of these uh, proposals that the countries are making, or we will make until the end of this year. Um, there is information requested in terms of conservation objectives and in terms of management tools. And I think if this information is then provided, it can also be helpful to analyze the, the, the effectiveness. Of course, there are many techniques and we have done some, some analysis uh, using uh, different data sets and looking at uh, the distribution of Natura 2000 and distribution of species and habitats, looking at its conservation status and try to see if there was any kind of statistical link between, for instance, the proportion of the species or a habitat inside Natura 2000 and its conservation status. Uh, due to the data, some of these statistics are not uh, really delivering any confident uh, uh, results. But for instance, for habitat types, we can see that habitats that are showing uh, um, an improving trend in conservation status, they tend to be more covered by Natura 2000 than those that have a, a smaller proportion in Natura 2000. Yeah, thank you, Carlos. Thank you for a clear answer. Um, so now, the last moment for all of you to raise a question or to write it down to the chat if you wish. If not, 
let me at first thank to Carlos. Carlos, thank you very much for your time and for the preparation for the presentation. Uh, I hope that uh, you enjoyed and you you got quite new information from the presentation. And please share the presentation with others who would be interested uh, from the YouTube channel, where it will be uh, posted very soon, hopefully today. So thank you very much to all of you, um, and hopefully to uh, meet you during some other uh, online event in our project. Have a good day. Have a good day, and thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.